What is up, watch fam? Happy Wednesday and welcome to this week's collection review. I'm Christian from Theo and Harris, and today we're jumping into an absolutely incredible uh, vintage watch collection for the most part. So let's do it. Okay, before we jump in, a quick wristwatch check. I am wearing a beautiful Rolex Reference 1603. The steel case is sharp and it's retained its original finishing, both brushed on the top lugs and uh, extremely well polished on the sides. That's the Rolex factory. A stunning engine turned bezel, and in my opinion, the most impressive part, this, like, custard or maybe even more aptly named like uh, a haystack tritium patina throughout all the loom dots as well as the hands. So this watch um, is definitely a personal favorite of mine. It was just listed yesterday uh, on theoandharris.com, so I'm not sure if it's still available, uh, but whether it is or isn't, I highly recommend you go over to theoandharris.com uh, and check it out, uh, whether in the sold section or in the current inventory. Uh, Anna's photos were phenomenal and uh, definitely worth uh, inspecting this watch a little further. So let's jump into this collection. So first, I want to thank Robin for sending this collection in. Uh, Robin's got a, 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 a truly well-curated collection, especially for a 25-year-old uh, person. That is um, that is impressive. Not only has Robin invested quite a bit of money into this collection, but it's obvious to me there's been plenty of time and study and you know, research and, and kind of curation uh, that's gone into this collection so far. So let's jump into it watch by watch. First, this Omega from the 1940s with this kind of taupe sector dial. Uh, not only is it beautiful, which is everyone something everyone can kind of see and acknowledge here, uh, but it looks to me like it's a jumbo, maybe a 36 or possibly even a 37 millimeter watch. I mean, that's a, that's a very big watch uh, for a vintage Omega. Either that or you, Robin, have very small wrists, uh, which actually you mentioned, 6.66 inch wrists, right? Very specific. Um, but uh, either way, jumbo or not jumbo, this is beautiful. Not only is it fully original, which is extremely rare in this kind of world of vintage Omega, uh, but sector dials uh, make it even more so like this interesting kind of obscure look. Uh, I'm not someone that needs that. Uh, I, you know, as I'm sure you do, appreciate super simplicity uh, in these vintage Omegas. That's what they did more commonly, uh, and it's kind of what I fell in love with to begin with. But when I do have the opportunity to see a vintage Omega like this. With this taupe sector dial, uh, it kind of reminds me that while Omega was doing super simplistic design, they were also experimenting. Uh, and, and experimenting in things we don't see all too often, maybe in alternative markets. You know, I, I don't know where they were doing it. So both as someone who appreciates the just design of something, as well as a watch geek, as well as someone who really wants to know what Omega was doing at a certain period of time, in the 40s in this example, um, I love this watch. So major props for owning it. Next, a chronograph from probably one of my favorite chronograph brands, Breitling, an 815 uh, panda dial chronograph. Uh, not only sunburst on the dial itself, but on the sub dials as well. Uh, you've picked one in incredible condition. I've seen them in pretty beaten up condition that I personally view as buys as well because the watches are so interesting to me, but yours is immaculate. Uh, I do wonder what you paid for it. It is a very interesting kind of market there because there are other watches from other off brands that deliver watches that are just as good and just as well designed as this Breitling for less money. But even while I do think that those watches in that $1,000 to $1,600 range are bound to continue to increase, the Breitling has the opportunity uh, to not only double or go up by 20%, but to triple, to quadruple. You know, the brand matters. And although you might think of it as irrelevant, uh, I do suggest you take a look at the video we released going back two weeks ago. Uh, Anna, please link it below. Uh, it was about Breitling's recent advertisement uh, in The Bachelorette. I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's true. The same way that Tudor's repopularization, if that's a word, uh, in the mass market and like the, the mainstream consumers has helped their vintage market incredibly, that same thing could happen to Breitling because I think that so many of these Breitlings are so undervalued. And we're talking about pretty much so top tier Breitlings are worth six grand. That's very small amounts of money compared to what Rolexes and Hoyers are worth. So there's a big jump uh, in the future for Breitling if they play their cards right. 
Next, an IWC caliber 89 in pink gold. I'll be quick with this one. My, my thoughts are very pointed and very, you know, just direct. Um, this is a wonderful watch. This is a watch that more people should own. Uh, it's also a watch that is, I don't want to say faked, but frankened a lot um, because IWCs are a little bit less collectible for some bizarre reason. So, so many people I know have purchased watches that are kind of, um, you know, not correct, sadly enough, uh, but yours, at least from the photo as I see it, uh, not only do the hands look correct, but the dial and the case and all that stuff. Uh, so, wonderful watch, particularly in rose gold. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, usually rose gold is a much more valuable metal than yellow. I love yellow as well, so there's no, for me, there's no real preference, um, but needless to say, major props for owning a pink gold IWC, so. Next uh, is a Hoyer Military Chronograph, um, which I think is kind of very undervalued. It's the Bund Watch, um, 43 millimeters, black dial, black bezel. Uh, this is a true tool watch uh, issued to pilots, I believe for quite a long while in the Luftwaffe, right? Is that how you say that? Um, so that has an odd kind of history, but I know that many of these were produced um, you know, later. You know, I don't think it's a Nazi watch. I think we're talking about the 60s and 70s. Uh, so you know, this is when the Luftwaffe was kind of clean hands of all of that uh, that you might expect from, uh, for argument's sake, an IWC pilot. Uh, so no, we're not gonna dip into Nazi territory today. Uh, but overall, I think it's a watch that deserves a lot more attention. I think the 43 is definitely big, uh, but because it is big for a reason, I have no problem with it. I have no problem with a 55 millimeter watch uh, if it was 55 millimeters for a reason beyond like it looked good, said the tasteless you know person in the corner. So uh, so that's it, big, big, big props, big props on owning um, probably one of the last rare desirable Hoyers that are relatively affordable. And finally, a Rolex date reference 15,000, uh, which is the quick set version of the 1500, uh, which I have right here. Uh, beautiful watch, yours is in a gray dial. Mine is in a blue dial with a sunburst patina. I do like mine more because I like patina, uh, sorry. But yours is beautiful. Uh, gray dial Rolexes, if you are familiar with the Rolex market, are not common. Uh, they are rare watches, they are beautiful watches, definitely, uh, even beyond rarity. So, uh, so major props. I know it's in service right now, but I hope that the service goes well, uh, and, and that's it. I mean, everyone knows that I'm a major Rolex fan. It's probably you know one of my favorite value props of these 34 millimeter Rolexes. Okay, so now let's give you a recommendation. Uh, your, your desired goal, your future goals are so much different than I would expect. I mean, you're talking about FP Journe, Long and Zone, Breguet. I mean, this is not something that I saw coming from you. I mean, but in, in the same list, you also mentioned, you know, a vintage Rolex. Rolex, you know, maybe from a 1675 um, or, a, or a 5513. So that does really interest me. I mean, to me, it makes perfect sense that you would go with with a with a fuchsia, maybe 1675. You know, that that makes that's that would be my recommendation for you, um, or 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 something else in that military kind of world. Maybe Gilles Colt uh, from the military era. That seems like it would be your style. Maybe one of the Dirty Dozen vintage Sima watches. I mean, these aren't my style per se, but they seem like they are yours. But oddly enough, you're going in the direction of FP Jorn and Long and Zone and Breguet. So I guess my biggest question to you um, is, do you really like those watches? I know that's kind of an obvious question, um, but to me it seems like something that needs to be asked. You know, how is it that you've curated a, a five-piece collection of, of true tool watches uh, and now you're looking for, you know, a, a, a Breguet, you know, what was the reference? Um, 5207. You know, beautiful watch, just doesn't seem like something you would like. And if your answer is yes, then I say go for it. I mean, you know, go go for the Breguet, go for the Jorn. I'm a huge Jorn fan. Uh, even more so, I'm a big Langa fan. I think the Langa represents even more value. You're talking about watches that are thirteen thousand dollars as opposed to nineteen or twenty-one. So yeah, you know where my loyalty lies. I go with Langa all the way home at thirteen grand or fourteen grand or fifteen grand. Are you going to regret not buying the perfect patinaed 1675 with a fuchsia bezel and original Jubilee bracelet? I don't know. That's it, guys. Thank you so much for watching this week's collection review. Thank you, Robin, for sending in your collection. You've got a wonderful array of watches. I wish you the best moving forward, uh, and I really recommend you try on these super uh, dress pieces, because if you like them, uh, you may be reinvented as a 
watch collector, you know, and as a person, not true. Just as a watch collector. Thanks so much for watching, and that's it.